Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our Introduction to Biblical Studies course. And today you can see we have come to the ruins of Roman Corinth, this ancient town in Greece where two letters of the New Testament were written. It's fitting that we come here to Greece today because all of the New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament, while written mostly in Hebrew and Aramaic, was translated early into Greek, and it's a fitting place to consider today's topic, textual criticism, where we're asking the essential question, what was the original wording of the Bible? What was the original wording in the original languages of the biblical texts? Let's look at our agenda for today. We're first going to look at the general principles of textual criticism. This will take up most of our time today. And then we'll look at the specifics of Old Testament textual criticism, followed by New Testament textual criticism. They really are two different things. So let's go ahead and begin with some general principles. Textual criticism, first and foremost, is the first operation of the historical critical method. It's the beginning of this method. You'll remember we learned in our last class the historical critical method is a diachronic method. It looks at how the text evolved over time. In textual criticism, we're looking at what the original wording likely was, given how it's been transmitted through many different manuscripts. To begin with, let's make clear what textual criticism is and what it is not. As I've said already, it's the discipline that seeks to establish the original wording of the text in its original language. Please note, we are not talking about translational differences right here. We're also not talking about analysis of the text's history before it attained its final form. So we're not looking at sources here. We're not looking at what the oral sayings that lie behind a given biblical book are. We're not interested in that here. We're also not interested in the various literary features of the text. We're not looking at what genre we're reading or what literary devices are being used or what poetic devices are being used. Our task here, rather, is to figure out what words were in the original. And from the outset, I want to say that the key principle of textual criticism is that the best reading, when presented with different variants, different wordings of the same text, the best one is the one that best explains how the others developed. Before we delve any further, let's look at some vocabulary. First, manuscripts are handwritten copies of texts. That's something of a tautology. Manu, coming from the word for hand in Latin, and script, coming from the Latin word for writing, handwritten copies of texts, which are studied to discern the most likely original wording of the text in its final form. A text type is a group of manuscripts, we might call them a family of manuscripts, that tend to agree with each other. That is, they tend to have the same kinds of variants. They seem to have a common origin. They seem to be related. All of this is a quest for the wording of the autographs. The autographs are the hypothetical original text. The key thing for us to understand is we don't have any of the autographs. We don't have the original final form of the Gospel of Mark or Luke or Matthew or Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. We don't have that. We just have handwritten copies from centuries later. A variant is a difference in wording between manuscripts. Our task in textual criticism is to determine when we have variants, which one is most likely the accurate one. We also have a couple of vocabulary words here that describe common errors that occur in transmission. That is, why do variants come to arise over time? Sometimes, if you've ever had to copy something by hand, you'll notice that sometimes you write the same thing twice without realizing it. That's known as a dittography. The opposite of it is when you accidentally leave a word out. You might have done that before if you've had to copy something by hand. You inadvertently leave something out. That's known as a haplography. If our goal in textual criticism is to figure out the original wording, we're going to need to figure out what are some of the causes of error. What are the kinds of things we're looking for when we compare different variants? What might explain how errors find their way into manuscripts? And we can distinguish between two basic kinds, unintentional errors and intentional errors. Unintentional errors occur due to poor hearing or poor vision. Keep in mind, as we've learned earlier, most of these manuscripts were produced in a scriptorium during the Middle Ages. That is, someone stood at the front of the room reading a text and others were writing down what they heard. Sometimes they heard the wrong thing or had poor short-term memory and forgot what they heard. Other times, if 
if they were looking at a, at a text or if the person reading the text out loud said the wrong thing, there could be a haplography or a dictography. Other times there might be misspellings or the word order could be confused. Another kind of unintentional error is that sometimes a marginal note or a gloss, some little summary or paraphrase might appear in the margin, which a later scholar confused for being the actual text and thus it inadvertently got copied into a later manuscript. We can distinguish these unintentional errors from intentional errors where a scribe thinks he's improving what he regards as poor grammar or style, or correcting apparent historical errors or other what he would think of as a mistake in the text. Other times, the text seemed doctrinally suspicious and a scribe might try to quote unquote correct it to make it better. All of these are reasons why errors get introduced into the manuscript tradition. So at the risk of oversimplifying things, here's something of a workflow. Here's how we do textual criticism. We ask three questions. Question number one, does the variant I'm studying produce nonsensical results? That is, does it produce a nonsense word or something that is utterly devoid of meaning? Think kofefe, but in biblical scholarship. If it's yes, then reject the variant as meaningless. It can't possibly be the case. It's an obvious mistake. Now, when I say nonsensical results, I don't mean poor grammar. I don't mean inelegant manners of speaking. I mean something that is utterly meaningless, something that is just utter nonsense. If the answer is no, then we move to question number two, which is, does the variant appear to fit any usual category of clear error? We just looked at those. Sometimes the answer is going to be yes. We'll be able to say, ah, clear haplography, clear dictography. Clearly, this person took what was a difficult doctrinal text and smoothed it out a little bit. If the answer is yes, then we're gonna reject the variant as a clear error. If not, we're gonna to drop to question number three, which is, does the evidence for the variant outweigh other possibilities? This is where we have to weigh evidence, and this can be difficult. If yes, then we're gonna accept the variant as more likely. If the answer is no, however, the evidence is still more favorable for a different variant, then we're gonna reject the variant we're studying as less likely. Again, notice we have to weigh evidence here. Notice the word prove does not fit in here. Here are some considerations that scholars use when weighing evidence. They distinguish between external evidence and internal evidence. External evidence looks at different manuscripts, looks at things outside the manuscript that's being studied. First, we're going to prefer readings that are broadly attested geographically. That is, if the same reading at the same time could be found in Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, it's likely genuine. It's unlikely that three different places made the same mistake. We're going to prefer readings that are attested in antiquity. The older the manuscript, the more weight we give it in scholarship. Scholars also assess the reading in light of the relative strength of the text type. Over time, scholars have learned that some text types are more reliable than others. Internal evidence, by contrast, looks at the manuscript itself. In general, scholars prefer the more difficult reading, the Lectio Difficilior in Latin, simply on the grounds that difficulties get smoothed out, usually erroneously over time. So if you've got a reading that's more difficult versus a reading that's simpler, usually the more difficult reading is more genuine. Generally also, scholars will prefer the briefer reading, where there's a choice between a shorter reading and a longer reading, generally the briefer reading is more likely to be genuine. This is the Lectio Brevior canon of textual criticism. Also, readings that seem to harmonize with parallel passages generally are not genuine. Finally, we'll usually prefer readings that are consistent with a given human author's established vocabulary and style. The theory is that a given human author is more likely to be consistent than inconsistent. So those are the different principles scholars use when doing textual criticism. Now let's say a few words about the Old Testament and the New Testament. First, the Old Testament. Scholars begin with the Masoretic text, the MT, the Hebrew text. This is a single manuscript that is regarded as the most authoritative in Hebrew Bible studies. The manuscript of the Masoretic text that we used was written in 1008 AD, so it's early 11th century. It's the results of a group of Hebrew scholars who transmitted the text first just but with consonants, because the Hebrew alphabet only contains 22 consonants, 
But over time, they perfected a system of adding vowels, these little dots and little symbols above and below the letters to indicate what the vowels ought to be. Although this Masoretic text has some corruptions, it's the best text that we have because no effect can be greater than its cause. The Hebrew is simply going to be more authoritative than any translation. That said, these translations, or the versions as they're called in textual criticism, we can distinguish between two kinds, primary versions and secondary versions. The primary versions include the Septuagint, which is in Greek, the Aramaic Targums, the Syriac Peshitta, the Old Latin, as well as St. Jerome's Vulgate. And then there are other languages translations that are based off one of the other translations. These different translations can be especially helpful when the Hebrew is uncertain or where the Hebrew can be interpreted in one of a couple different ways, or if the Hebrew text is just corrupted. Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, gave us other manuscripts that were written in Hebrew. They're earlier manuscripts, and they often confirm, but sometimes challenge, the Masoretic text. You can see on your screen here how the Hebrew original and some of the translations are related to one another. The Hebrew autographs, again, that's the Hebrew books of the Old Testament in their original final form. They were transmitted in two main families with Qumran standing in between. Qumran was a repository that collected all different kinds of manuscripts and they're related to different families. You had the Hebrew Masoretic text, or at least an early version of what became the Masoretic text. And then you have what scholars call the Hebrew Vorlage, which is a German word that means early edition. This Hebrew Vorlage is what the translators of the Septuagint used to translate that Hebrew manuscript into Greek. And we think that already, a couple hundred years before the time of Jesus, you had these two different Hebrew text families that substantially differed from one another in a couple of key cases, especially the book of Jeremiah. Let's say a few words now about the New Testament. The New Testament is very, very well preserved, much more so than any other classical literature. Indeed, it has thousands of manuscripts. These manuscripts fall into generally five categories. There are papyri, which are very ancient, but they're in generally poor physical condition and they only preserve small amounts of text. Perhaps the most valuable manuscripts for the New Testament are the four main unseal codices. By unseal, we mean they're in all capital letters without spaces. The four main unseal codices are Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Beze. And you'll notice here, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, you've got three different text types represented here. In general, and I'm talking right now just about the Gospels, scholars will prefer Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus to the other two. The Alexandrian text type is regarded as the most authoritative, at least regarding the Gospels. Additionally, there are minuscules. These are Greek manuscripts where lowercase letters are used. Lectionaries, these are books used in worship that have readings appointed for different celebrations. And patristic citations. These are the writings of the early church fathers that quote the scriptures. All of these inform our understanding of the text as well as do a number of different translations into Latin, Syriac, and other languages. Unlike the Old Testament, where scholars generally follow that one manuscript that was copied in 1008 AD, most scholars today use an eclectic Greek New Testament. By eclectic, I mean scholars have surveyed a wide range of different manuscripts, and they've selected in a number of individual cases what they regard as the best reading. Admittedly, this has been a very cursory overview of textual criticism, but it should be enough to get us started. We're gonna be developing this knowledge as we go into our upper level courses and we see specific text critical questions that arise in various readings. Until we meet next time, read well and pray well.